Thanks very much indeed. I hope you can hear me okay. Um, and uh, my apologies for not being there in person. I'm in a very wet and cold uh, Manchester, so I know where I would much rather be, but uh, unfortunately travel plans uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't make it possible. Um, by way of disclosure, um, I need to uh, declare my association with Medartis. Uh, I'm designer of the, or co-designer of the Medartis coronoid plate, which I will be showing uh, through this talk. I do not receive any royalties uh, from from that. So m my approach to instability is quite simple. Uh, we need to understand the anatomy. We need to recognize patterns of injury. And then once we understand the pattern of injury, we need to have an algorithm that we can apply to treating that, that, uh, that pattern. And once it's stable, we get the elbow moving straight away. And Schreiber has taught us the value of overhead mobilization, which not only neutralizes the distracting forces across the elbow, but also uh, produces uh, less tone in biceps and gives us better elbow extension. So how do we dislocate our elbows? Well, that's the sort of thing that can happen. Uh, obviously fairly uh, high energy violent injury, but look at the position of the elbow as uh, as it dislocates. And we would get an x-ray, of course, and that's uh, typically what we would see. Um, uh, um, dislocation of the elbow with intact uh, bony elements. You're allowed to have small flakes off the medial and lateral epicondyles that would still constitute a simple elbow dislocation, but you're not allowed to see a coronoid fracture that immediately uh, takes it out of the simple uh, elbow dislocation classification. The, the question is, what do we do with them? How should we manage these injuries? We, of course, need to reduce them. And most of the time, it, certainly in our practice, they're reduced in, uh, in uh, the accident emergency department by somebody with a fairly limited knowledge of the elbow. They certainly don't undergo an examination of stress uh, views at the time of reduction. And you're normally presented with an elbow that is uh, reduced and typically in a cast. What, what do we know about the natural history? We know that about 8% of um, uh, simple dislocations go on to persistent symptomatic instability. But more, 40% have ongoing stiffness and pain in the elbow, which may be features of, uh, of instability or could be related to the initial management. So the real question is, what are the predictors of a poor prognosis? What are the predictors of instability? So thinking back to our basic sciences and our under understanding of the anatomy of the elbow, we've got osseous stabilizers, we've got ligamentous stabilizers, and then we've got the neuromuscular stabilizers. And the elbow isn't symmetrical. On the medial side of the elbow, you've got really good osseous stability. You've got the distal humerus covered through an arc of nearly 180 degrees by the proximal ulna. Uh, and on the medial side, the bony elements take priority. On the lateral side, we've got very poor bony coverage of the distal humerus through an arc of uh, around 90 degrees, uh, which is more akin to the shoulder, where we know that neuromuscular and ligamentous uh, stability is, takes, takes precedence. So it's really important to understand that concept about the difference between medial instability and lateral instability and the importance of the soft tissue structures on the lateral side, particularly when we're thinking about sim simple dislocations. And you also need to think about the extrinsic forces. So the pull of the triceps, the brachialis, the biceps, common flexor and common extensors, which produce a joint reaction force pulling the proximal, uh, the, the forearm onto the distal humerus in this direction. So when we look at simple dislocations and, uh, and do MRI scans, what we find is that actually in the majority of cases, they have injuries to the medial collateral ligament um, uh, uh, structures it's much less likely that they'll have an injury to the lateral ligament complex. And so that should be good news for stability in the majority of cases. The problem with this study is that uh, they only uh, um, did MRI scans in a small proportion of the patients that presented with um, 
simple dislocations and potentially there was a, a selection bias as to which patients got MRIs and which didn't. The same group showed us that actually simple dislocations don't occur in flexion. They are uh, hyperextension and valgus injuries, overhead injuries, or f uh, falls onto the hand. The arm goes into hyperextension and valgus, and the injury starts on the medial side. So look at the position of this uh, uh, chap's elbow just before he contacts the ground. He's in hyperextension. And then he goes into valgus and and uh, and uh, his elbow dislocates. So we did a, a, conducted a study looking at a consecutive prospective series of simple elbow dislocations. And we did MRI scans in every patient. And just as Schreiber had shown, what we found is that the patients were uh, all had, if it was a posterolateral lateral dislocation, which is by far the majority of dislocations, all of them had uh, injuries to the medial collateral ligament. A good proportion had lateral collateral ligament injuries, and uh, uh, the vast majority had an injury to the common flex origin. But what really is differentiating and, and important for determining the management for a simple elbow dislocation is the injury to the common extensor origin. Uh, and very few had complete ruptures of the common extensor origin, and that really tells us uh, whether they're stable or unstable, and so if you if you organise uh, those injury patterns, what we can see is that a simple elbow dislocation, if it's posterior lateral, which would be eighty to ninety percent of your simple elbow dislocations, there is a spectrum of injury. In some patients, they won't have a functional tear of any of the ligaments. The, the next grade of injury, they tear their medial ligament, then their lateral ligament, then their common flexor origin, and then the common extensor origin where, by which uh, everything is stripped off the distal humerus. And so we've uh, proposed this concept of the injury ladder and, and grading your simple elbow dislocations based on an MRI scan from grade one to grade four. And it's the grade four injuries that we think that are the ones that are likely to require surgical treatment. The rest, we believe, you can manage uh, non-operatively uh, and expect a favorable outcome. The, um, the, the point about how we manage them is if somebody's stuck at the top of a ladder, you take them down one rung of a ladder at a time. You don't uh, start chopping bits off the bottom of the ladder. So when we're managing these injuries, we will typically uh, fix the lateral side first, reassess, if they're still unstable, then go in and fix the medial side. And it's relative, It's very simple surgery because if they need surgery, then you cut through the skin and your finger will go straight into the joint. And you just open it up, put a suture into the uh, collateral ligament and fix it back with an anchor. You may not have ready access to MRI scan. Um, and if you don't, uh, then the alternative is to take the patient to theatre and do an examination under anaesthesia. In my institution, uh, getting patients to theatre is a more limited resource than an MRI scan. And actually, the volume of simple elbow dislocations is not that great. That uh, if we were to do MRI scans in them all, we're going to overwhelm our uh, radiology services. So, uh, I personally, I think that's the best way to stratify these injuries. But you can use, as Schnetzka has taught us, uh, an EUA. And if they gap more than uh, five millimeters, more than 10 degrees, then that suggests that there's a significant uh, instability, which is going to be predictive of recurrent instability of the elbow with a six times greater risk. So if you look at the MRI scan for patient A, you've got a torn medial collateral ligament, an injury to the common flexor origin. The lateral ligament common extensor origin is intact. I would treat that non-operatively. Patient B, everything is off medially and laterally. That patient would be taken to theatre, examination under anesthesia and stabilisation surgical. For both patients, we would start immediate active mobilization uh, on uh, day one and, uh, and expect a, a good, uh, good outcome from that. So really important to understand that when dealing with simple elbow dislocations, it's a spectrum of injury. I think an MRI scan is useful. There, we don't have reliable um, clinical predictors. Obviously, there may be a relationship between the MRI scan and significant displacement on x-rays. Incongruency of the joint post-reduction may suggest loose bodies within the joint, and that will, would mandate surgical intervention. 
but reluctance of the patient to move the elbow does not predict a, a low grade injury or sorry a high grade injury uh, if they're moving it they can still have a high grade injury so so be careful of that bruising on the lateral aspect may suggest a more high grade injury and so that is a clinical sign that may be of use there are randomized controlled trials uh, comparing surgical to non-surgical treatment of simple elbow dislocation uh, and this one by uh, Josephson uh, found absolutely no difference in the outcome. But of course, that makes perfect sense if we consider that these are uh, this is a spectrum of injury and the vast majority of patients don't need surgical intervention. And if you don't stratify the patients when entering the trial, then you're never going to find a significant difference between surgical and non-surgical treatment because the vast majority do not need surgery. The, um, the FUNCSI trial looked at uh, early versus late mobilization and showed really no difference in the long-term outcome, but there was an early benefit to immediate mobilization. They've, they reported no cases of long-term instability, but it's really important when interpreting this data to understand that this was a selected group of patients. They selected out elbows that they determined were stable before entering them into the trial, and, uh, and that's sometimes forgotten. I think the, the best evidence that we have short of a randomized controlled trial comes from Lars uh, Adelson's paper where he looked at patients with recurrent instability of the elbow. And what he showed was that the, those with posterolateral dislocations uh, who had recurrent instability had extensive injury on the lateral side of the elbow, which fits with our empirical uh, uh, management for these, uh, for these patients. But the other thing that is really important from this study is the large proportion of post-remedial dislocations. So post-remedial dislocations account for about 10% of, of uh, simple elbow dislocations, but they disproportionately account for recurrent instability. And why is that? Well, the reason for that is that they're much more likely to tear those soft, important soft tissue structures on the lateral side. And we're all familiar with the Hori cycle. Uh, and these injuries follow the Hori cycle. So what Sean O'Driscoll was talking about in his paper about being able to dislocate the elbow with an intact medial ligament applies when you have a posterior medial dislocation and you, the injury starts laterally and travels medially. And, uh, and uh, in those cases, they will need surgical stabilization because you've evulsed the soft tissue stabilizers. And I think that uh, injury pattern is really on a, on a spectrum with PLRI, uh, radial head fractures and terrible uh, triad injuries. That's probably a spectrum of, of injury related to the force that's applied across the elbow. So thinking about more chronic injuries and postrolateral rotatory instabilities, the elbows are by far the, uh, the most common uh, injury on the lateral side. Um, MRI scan, again, is really helpful. Uh, don't uh, rely on subluxation of the radial head because there's so much overlap between what's normal and what's abnormal. But do look at uh, gapping of the ulnar humeral joint laterally because that is uh, highly predictive. And also do look for an Osborne cotteral lesion. So that uh, uh, small bony injury off the back of a capitellum that you can appreciate here because this uh, reflects uh, um, an important ligamentous injury to the uh, elbow. Originally uh, described by uh, Osborne Cottrell and given the name Osborne Cottrell lesion by Inho who's on the faculty uh, today, um, the, uh, the, the injury can occur even in the presence of an intact lateral ligament complex and is an important uh, um, injury to, uh, to recognize because it can be associated with a more subtle instability. We did some cadaveric work looking at the importance of this ligament uh, when simulating a posterior draw. And what we found was that it, it doesn't produce the same degree of instability as cutting the lateral ligament complex, but it's more unstable in, in the radial head is more unstable in posterior draw compared to an intact uh, uh, situation. So we think that and I, that that can be a cause of instability uh, and we need to revisit our anatomy of the lateral elbow. We've got the LUCL 
uh, but the post, uh, and the radio collateral ligament, but the important uh, posterior lateral ligament mustn't be forgotten. You need to look for that uh, injury and uh, address it if you see it. The sort of signs you need to look for in an MRI scan is is this acute angle between the posterior capsule. The, the articular cartilage should run, run right up to the posterior capsule uh, on this um, uh, sagittal slice, uh, and if it doesn't, then it's probably avulsed. When you scope the elbow and supinate, you see some gapping, uh, and then if you scope in the posterolateral uh, compartment, you see that bare area just proximal to the articular cartilage there, and as I supinate the uh, forearm, the radial head will subluxate, even in this case with an intact uh, lateral ligament complex. Um, and when we open up, so this is a, through a Boyd approach, you can see that posterior capsular avulsion, which is relatively easy just to tack back with an anchor. For more chronic cases of uh, uh, Osborne cotral le lesions with instability, uh, I use the Van Riet technique. Um, uh, but if it's a more extensive injury where the lateral ligament complex is involved as well, uh, and they've got a positive pivot shift, uh, then uh, we would obviously uh, treat those with a lateral ligament reconstruction. Those more uh, conservative approaches are not going to work for that. Did we scan every elbow looking for an Osborne cotral lesion? Absolutely not, but we should be aware that it can be an important pathology. And if a uh, patient's not behaving in the way you would expect, then do look for it uh, and, uh, and treat it accordingly. So for simple desiccations, they are not so simple. Uh, we, they do require a bit more thought than, than uh, sort of a, a knee-jerk reflex. Most can be managed non-operatively, but we need to recognize which are the bad actors. And I think that an MRI scan or an EUA can help us do that. So uh, with the uh, Chairman's permission, I'm going, going to go straight on to considering more complex injuries, um, the, uh, and that is elbow fracture dislocations. The not so simple dislocations, what on earth are we going to do with these? How We need a plan, and, uh, and to, to come up with a plan, again, we need to recognise the patterns of injury. We need to have a management plan based on anatomical principles, but also we need to use the X-rays to predict the hidden injury, the tell, the x-rays of the tell that tell us about the uh, the uh, likely soft tissue injuries that, that are going to be associated. There are only so many ways that you can uh, wrench the forearm off the end of the humerus. So you can rotate laterally, you can rotate medially, you can apply a bending moment or you can apply an axial load. And in fact, uh, these map very nicely to the types of injuries that we see. So uh, a external rotation uh, injury, uh, lateral external rotation injury is a t produces a terrible triad. A, a postromedial rotator injury produces a postromedial fracture dislocation or PMRI. The transverse forces produce Montegia, Montegia-like lesions and transelectron fracture dislocations, apex anterior or apex posterior. And then if you fall onto an extended outstretched hand with enough force, then you'll produce a longitudinal radial ulnar dissociation and that's it's repressed uh, injury. But you'll note that I've skipped a longitudinal force with a flexed elbow because that actually doesn't isn't currently recognized with any of the classifications uh, that uh, that are, have been used. Um, and it produces, importantly, a, a bifacet coronoid fracture with a radial head fracture. But the injury, ligamentous injury pattern is different, and I'll come on to talk about that a, a little bit later on. So it's very easy when we look at a lateral uh, radiograph of an elbow fracture dislocation to be distracted by the radial head fracture. But what we need to focus on is the hidden injury behind that, which is the coronoid fracture. Much more subtle, often thought of as benign, but the coronoid is absolutely the key to understanding the elbow fracture dislocation. We've historically used the Regan and Mori classification, uh, as uh, Professor Gavisis has talked, uh, has talked about very nicely. The problem is that this underestimates the severity of the injury. All of these are tip of coronoid fractures, and all of these are, are associated with substantial instability. 
So clearly, the Regan and Morrow classification doesn't help us to decide how to, to manage these injuries. The O'Driscoll classification, really a fantastic contribution uh, to, the, to the literature because it highlights the importance of thinking about the coronoid as a 3D structure. I thought it was really interesting that uh, in uh, Ixis in Rome uh, a couple of weeks ago that uh, Sean O'Driscoll was talking about his classification and about how uh, he's frustrated that it's been the illustrations have been uh, reproduced that don't fully re uh, reflect what he talked about. Uh, and particularly the type A's, which are really anterolateral facet fractures, uh, rather than as in this illustration showing the injury extending to the medial uh, facet. As I've said, the coronoid is the key. This is our first principle. And you can divide the proximal forearm into three columns. So we have the radial head as a lateral column. We have the anterolateral facet as the middle column and the anteromedial facet as the medial column of the elbow. And the three column concept teaches us about how uh, to think about elbow fracture dis dislocations. The important uh, concept is that the fulcrum for stability lies between your anteromedial facet of the coronoid and the anterolateral facet. If I take away the anterolateral facet in isolation, then the elbow remains stable because you've still got the, the radial head maintaining stability on the lateral uh, side uh, of, of the fulcrum. But of course, that doesn't really happen because uh, it's protected by the radial head. But we can fracture the radial head in isolation. And if, if the, as long as the soft tissues are intact, then you can have relative stability with that. We know that. Um, uh, and we will often treat uh, Mason 1s, Mason 2 radial head fractures non-operatively because the anterolateral facet contributes to stability, the ligaments contribute to stability, and we have a relatively stable elbow. If we, however, take away the anterolateral facet and the radial head, then we have no stabilizers lateral to our fulcrum. The elbow has to be unstable. It collapses into valgus, and uh, that is a terrible fired injury. But once we understand that, we know how to treat that injury. The way to treat that is to restore the radial head. We've already agreed that that's a stable uh, situation, so we don't have to fix the anterolateral facet fracture don't waste time putting loop sutures around that. It's not going to add to the stability as long as we adequately address the radial head and importantly address the soft tissue stabilizers by fixing the lateral ligament complex. We might have to go medial and fix the medial ligament if the common flex, the origin, is also injured, but we don't have to restore the anterolateral facet. The bad actor, of course, is the, uh, the posteromedial fracture dislocation where we've taken out the anteromedial facet because it's the only pillar medial to the fulcrum and so it collapses into valgus, uh, sorry, into varus. But look, it also avul avulses the lateral ligament complex and so that's the obligate soft tissue injury. We need to address that and restore the bony elements to restore stability. But there's also associated with this a posterior band of medial ligament injury that needs to be addressed. And so this three uh, column concept has led us to developing the right instant classification for elbow fracture dislocations. And we believe that we can address, we can um, apply this to all elbow fracture dislocations, uh, plug them into one of these classification, one of these categories, and then we have an algorithm for management. So an A is an isolated anteromedial fracture dislocation um, or anteromedial fragment, which is a, a PMRI. A B is a bifacet fracture with or without a radial head. C is a combined radial head and anterolateral facet. That's a terrible triad injury. And then you have fractures distal to the coronoid, where the coronoid is in continuity with the electron process with or without a radial head. With those, we have recognizable in ligamentous injury patterns that we can predict, as I've talked about uh, with the uh, three column concept. So for a, a, a type A pattern, how do we manage that? So we can recognize the injury. There's the small coronoid uh, tip fracture, but we now know it's not, uh, there's no such thing. It's an anteromedial facet fracture. We have narrowing of the joint line medially. That should be a worrying sign. And you can use CT scan 
uh, to identify the uh, the bony injury and you can appreciate now that it's a much worse injury than we had first thought these are injuries which are sustained by falling backwards onto your hand and the arm goes into a valgus thrust forcing the uh, forearm into varus and avulsing the lateral ligament complex when we examine them under anesthesia they have this varus instability and there are algorithms that have been proposed uh, saying, well, if it's more than five millimeters, we should fix the coronoid and then fix the lateral ligament complex. The problem is that it, that's really uh, uh, um, uh, not based on a lot of evidence. Uh, Ferruria suggested that actually most of these can be treated non-surgically, and he presented a series of 28 patients and reported on average low pain scores and low VAS scores. And his he uh, used a static CT scan to base his decision as to whether or not they needed surgery. And he suggested that his study provides empirical support for conservative management as the baseline for the majority of these patients. The problem is, as has already been alluded to, if we get the decision wrong, then these patients have a terrible outcome. So the risks are really high of making the wrong call here because they, if they're working age, they've now got an unstable arthritic elbow and we have no solution to, for that. If we look in more detail at Ferruria's study, actually quite a high proportion of patients had ongoing pain. Only half reported their elbow as being normal. A, large, a, a reasonable number had ongoing uh, requirements for surgery. Coronary non-unions were high medial joint space narrowing was high and 50 percent went on to signs of, uh, of osteoarthrosis so i think it's questionable as to whether non-surgical management is appropriate for the majority of these cases but there are some that we can get away with it so look at this 34 year old female an undisplaced coronoid fracture parallel joint lines on the radiograph I think MRI scan is by far and away the most useful investigation because I think that a CT scan will tell me what I already know. I already know that she's got an anteromedial facet fracture because she's got an isolated coronoid injury. But on the MRI scan, I can see that she's congruously unlocated. But most importantly, I can see the lateral ligament complex is intact. So what differentiates a simple, uh, or, uh, sorry, a stable uh, PMRI from an unstable PMRI, I believe, is a soft tissue injury. And if the ligaments are intact on MRI scan, treat them non-optively with close observation. And in the, as in this case, you can get a good outcome. This, a very similar looking injury in a 37-year-old, but clearly there's subluxation of the joint and narrowing on the AP view. In cast, it sits back quite nicely, and uh, um, you might think, well, probably we can get away with non-surgical treatment. But look at the MRI scan. In the MRI scan, she's subluxated, the lateral ligament is evolved, uh, and uh, the elbow is clearly unstable. And in that situation, in my hands, I would use arthroscopic techniques, but you need to be confident in the, in the use of arthroscopy to manage those injuries. They're intracapsular fractures, they're easier to manage arthroscopically. And if we're gonna treat this coronoid arthroscopically, we can treat the ligament arthroscopically as well. What about this? So this is a 44 year old male, and this is clearly a more complicated coronoid fracture. It's uh, clearly uh, more fragmented. When you look at the CT scan on Ferruria's classification, you might say, well, I'm going to treat that non-operatively. But start to look more medially, and you appreciate, actually, it is subluxated. And the MRI scan shows the lateral ligament is off. It needs surgery. And because of the fragmentation, I would use a plate to fix that through a medial uh, approach rather than a screw. Increasingly, I'm fixing the posterior band of the medial ligament because it's the own, it is the best um, stabilizer of rotatory uh, subluxation. And as we've talked about before, we need to try to avoid osteoarthrosis. So that's our algorithm for managing the type A injury. A B, type B injury by facet fracture is the Montegia light lesion or Montegia or uh, trans electron fracture dislocation. And that can be apex anterior or apex posterior. Bader classification is not very helpful. Jupiter classification, nobody can remember. 
but we can all recognize an apex anterior and apex posterior diversification of ringer's tortoise. Uh, this is apex anterior. The radial head is intact. It escapes from the humerus. We need to recognize that important coronoid piece and this piece, which has the medial ligament attached, and fix those with independent lag screws. This is a po apex posterior, much worse. The radial head has been driven into the humerus, is fractured. We need, you can often address the, the uh, fracture through the, the radial head, uh, sorry, the coronoid through the electron fracture, uh, and often you need to replace the radial head. But even in those complex injuries, you can achieve a very satisfactory outcome by uh, applying this algorithm. Fix the coronoid, fix the radial head, fix the lateral ligament complex, and if it's a um, Montegia type lesion, fix the uh, normal alignment of the ulna with a dorsal plate. A, a terrible triad is the type C, and I think we know how to fix those. They're not so terrible anymore. But what you need to recognize is that it's a valgus external rotation. The anteromedial facet is intact. We crunch down the radial head, we crunch the anterolateral facet, but the anteromedial facet is intact. That's a terrible triad. That's a, a type C pattern fix the radial head um, or uh, replace the radial head and uh, fix the lateral ligament complex. But uh, we've sh uh, we believe, we've shown, and uh, others have shown you don't have to fix the coronoid in that situation. How you address the radial head, well, that's probably a talk for another day. Um, the evidence uh, d shows uh, that there are benefits uh, to fixation or replacement, but actually it's really the fracture that dictates what you need to do. It is important to fix, uh, to replace the radial head properly when you're going to replace it. Know your implant and get the alignment right. If it's an in-neck implant, it has to go down the mechanical axis of the forearm aiming towards the ulnar styloid. Of course, you can't see the ulnar styloid on a plain radio, uh, on a fluorus scan. So we have a surrogate for that, which is the uh, distal extent of the radial tuberosity, which will be in your fluoroscopic view and lies perfectly on the mechanical axis. So if your implant doesn't point at the distal end of the tuberosity, it's malaligned and it'll lead to overstuffing. So make sure you get that right. The other thing, important way is to look at the ex proximal extent of the PRUJ and make sure your prosthesis never comes more proximal than that. And again, as with, sim with simple dislocations, look for an Osborne cotral lesion. The medial ligament, we don't need to fix in most cases, but we do if the uh, if the common flexor is off. Um, uh, and I'll skip over that for, for the sake of time. So that's our, our management algorithm. You don't need to fix the coronoid, except in one specific case, which I'll talk about. Um, but you do need to address the soft tissue structures. This is a really important injury. Currently uh, uh, unclassified, except for in the writings and classification. And this is a B plus injury. And this is very different to a terrible triad injury because the anteromedial facet is fractured. You tear the posterior ligaments, not the anterior ligaments, and you must fix the coronoid in this case. Relatively easy to do with a dorsal uh, screw uh, and either fix or replace the radial head. You can use a buttress plate in that situation. And then lastly, the type D injuries, distal to the coronoid process, uh, with or without a radial head, the algorithm is fix the ulna, fix or replace the radial head, and fix the lateral ligament complex. So that uh, uh, classification enables us to understand and recognize all elbow fracture dislocations, and it applies. we can apply an algorithm to each of those uh, patterns. We validated it. It's reproducible. 3D CT scans help us to, to uh, make the classification. But also we've shown that if you apply the algorithms that, that uh, we've described, then you can get good uh, or excellent outcomes in the vast majority of uh, cases. Thank you very much for your time.